Welcome to Japanorama. There's one thing that everybody desperately craves here in Japan. It's not power, it's not money, it's not even fame. No, those things are just means to an end. And that end is our word for tonight. Kawaii. Kawaii. That's right, and kawaii means... Cute. Kawaii means cute. And Japanese of all ages and all genders are absolutely obsessed with it, which means they'll love tonight's program. 100% kawaii, including special additives. Tanoshinde kudasai. We take you now to my apartment in Greater Tokyo. Kawaii infests just about every aspect of Japanese life, from the salary man with those adorable dingly dangly bits on his mobile phone to the housewife brandishing a Sailor Moon credit card to the schoolgirl kitted out from head to toe in character merchandise. Cute is loot. So let's lift up the rock of Kawaii and see what lurks beneath. Japan first became cute around 1970. According to legend, it began with Japanese schoolgirls passing notes to one another in rounded, childish characters. This became known as kitten writing, and by the mid-1980s, 55% of teenage girls in Japan were doing it. Now, since the rest of Japan takes its cultural cues from schoolgirls, this fad for faux childishness turned into a full-blown obsession with all things cute and innocent. And this, of course, led to a multi-billion pound industry. And to think it all began with girls passing notes, an art now extinct in an age of text messaging. In 1974, a designer named Ikuko Shimizu scribbled a simple drawing, and from that humble image, over 22,000 products have been launched, a veritable kingdom of kawaii, with a turnover of over $500 million a year. Hello Kitty's owner, the Sanrio Corporation, was originally in the silk business. Kitty was created as a cute image to boost its silk trade. But just as, say, the Virgin Group found its ventures into music and aeroplanes far more lucrative than selling virgins, the Sanrio company's sales of silk was soon surpassed by its sales of cute. Over the past 30 years, Hello Kitty's image has adorned everything from airplanes to diet pills to red wine. In fact, the only products that Hello Kitty's parent company, Sanrio, has rejected are sharp objects, guns, hard alcohol and cigarettes. One of the more ambitious Hello Kitty products has got to be the Hello Kitty robot. Costing nearly two and a half thousand pounds, this Kitty bot is more sophisticated than she looks. She's very uh, kawaii. Um, how do I play with her? How do I interact with her? Wow. Basically, you talk to it, and then you enjoy the conversation. Kitty chan, nazo nazo dashi. Nazo nazo dashete. Nazo nazo, Ah, Kitty Chan. Chocolate. Sorry, you lost. Let's play again. What are you talking about? I lost. Hold it, hold it. You asked me what I like, and then I told you, and then somehow I lost. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. The voice is too loud. I can't hear it. 
Bye bye. Jonathan, goodbye, Jonathan. Eat a lot. Okay. Well, I think it needs a little work, but it's great fun. Arigato gozaimasu. Arigato gozaimashita. Did you know that Kitty Chan is actually British? Well, it's true. According to her official story, Kitty White and her twin sister Mimi were born on the 1st of November 1974 in a suburb of London. Can you imagine how different her story would be if Hello Kitty hadn't moved to Japan? She'd probably now be known as Oi Cat, although she'd still be cute in a big-headed feline kind of way. The Japanese lifelong love of cute may be no more evident than in their passion for animation and the widespread nostalgia for the animation theme tunes they enjoyed while growing up. And one man riding this wave is Icharu Mizuki, the Robbie Williams of anime theme tunes. He has devoted his life to anime songs, which he now performs live to adoring fans of all ages. But just why have anime themes become so popular with young Japanese? When I was younger, there were so many different styles of music around, many different ways of expressing oneself through song. But with the current generation, some grow up listening only to anime themed songs. They are not familiar with anything else. One of the powerful pulls of anime songs seems to be their strong link to the show's hero. And Mizuki-san, who gives classes in anime singing, is determined to keep the anime hero spirit alive in the younger generation. I have some students that come to me saying they want to sing an anime hero song. Now the hero is groovy and very strong. But that's not what it's all about. You have to have the heart for why the hero has to fight bad guys. The singer needs to have that hero heart inside to make the song work. <laughs> These are two of Mizuki's most successful protégés. Known as Apple Pie, they've sung many anime themes themselves and will ensure that his hero heart is successfully transplanted into the next generation. Victory! Combine one, two, three, four, five. Shutsugeki da. Daichi o yugas cho denji robo. Combat la boom! And now Japanorama proudly presents Madame Shirota and her kawaii kids performing When in Japan. In Japan, when your bottom tooth falls out, you should throw it upwards over the roof of your house. If your top tooth falls out, you should throw it underneath the floor of your house. This symbolizes the wish that your newborn tooth will grow straight upwards quickly and that your new top tooth should grow straight downwards properly. This is a tradition that still carries on in Japan today. Sun. So. Ah. The Japanese love affair with cute anime marches on into the 21st century, but now the heroes of yesterday have been replaced by offbeat characters with a freaky edge.
Director Ryuji Masuda has completed several three-dimensional CGI animated series that whip raw cuteness into a sort of sticky batter, then bake it into a delicious cake filled with psychedelic eye candy. Masuda somehow manages to have his cake and eat it too. The most gruesome scenes are so beautifully paced, the character's expression so deadpan that the cuteness is never undermined by the violence. Even the random death of a lovable lizard is somehow uplifting. For his next CGI series, Funny Pets, Masuda mounted his surreal cuteness on the most brightly lit, vibrantly coloured stage imaginable. It's populated by just three simple characters. A voluptuous showgirl, a twisted crescent moon and a daft little sun. <sighs> In a sense, this is like Hello Kitty for a more jaded audience. But where is all this weirdness going to end? What happens when the irresistibly cute meets the intensely creepy? If I told you that this national obsession here in Japan for all things cute also had a dark side, then you probably wouldn't be that surprised. And the name for all this dark, cute stuff is Kawaii Noir. Recently, Kawaii Noir has become almost as popular in Japan as Kawaii itself. And the reigning queen of Kawaii Noir might well be Japanorama's very own Junko Mizuno whose superb art adorns every episode. Junko's works are somehow 100% cute and 100% dark. Now that's my kind of maths. But there's a new kid on the kawaii noir block and he's clawing his way to the top. <laughs> Gloomy Bear is a little pink bear that a little boy called Pity adopts and loves very much, but Gloomy Bear He's a bear, and every now and then, without warning, he takes a swipe of Pity. But Pity loves Gloomy and still wants to play with him, even though his mummy tells him not to. So Pity cries until he gets his way. And Gloomy is reunited with Pity, and all is well until he attacks Pity again. He's a bear. Eventually, Gloomy grows up, and becomes very large, and kills Pity in a dreadful way, and they never play again. Anyway, this sick, sad and sorry tale is now the hottest thing in Japan. As Hello Kitty taught us, Japan is truly a magical land where a simple drawing of a character can yield a billion pound marketing bonanza. And of all the possible successors to Kitty, none is hotter or more unlikely than Gloomy Bear. The creation of a young, self-taught illustrator named Maury Chak, Gloomy Bear is either a blunt antidote to the saccharine characters that predominate here, or a raw evocation of animal nature. It's not clear whether Mr Chak's empire will one day include gloomy theme parks and gloomy weddings, but for now, they're queuing up for his dolls, keychains, and even the knockabout animation you see here. Maury San, pleased to meet you. Ah, that's me too. I love the idea of Gloomy Bear. When did you come up with the idea and, and how did it spread throughout Japan? 
First, I got a job to draw a cute bear, but I thought a bear is not cute for cute's sake. So next to that, I drew a bear attacking a man. My client actually preferred that one. It seems strange at first the idea that a gloomy bear would attack the little boy Pity, who saved him. And yet people seem to like this idea. Why do you think that is? I felt the expression had not been made before. It's something new, what with the wilderness aspect. Um, I like the idea of seeing cute animals doing real things. Uh, any chance that we will see the bear stealing rubbish, taking a shit in someone's back garden, and maybe even uh, copulating or having sex with a female bear while Pithy looks on in tower? <laughs> I hadn't really thought that far ahead yet. But if you think of it as a normal bear, it could take on some animal characteristics like that. Oh, I'd like to see that. I could imagine a feature film with Gloomy, Gloomy Bear and many other Gloomy Bears going on a rampage in a small town would be, would be great fun. I'd like to do something like that. OK, well, I look forward to that day. Uh, really nice to meet you. Thank you for coming in. And I love Gloomy Bear, so thank you. Arigato gozaimasu. Gloomy Bear, arigato gozaimasu. He's not so fierce, really. Ow. This is a huge dream for us to be playing here. Well, what's my name? Kambarwa. We are the magic numbers. Rock and roll is cute, rock and roll is dark, and rock and roll is big money, especially if you can charm the Japanese. So find out how it's done, as each week we join the magic numbers, Romeo, Michelle, Sean and Angela on their debut Japanese tour. Hi, we're the magic numbers. Come join us on the road as we tour Japan. Arigato. Well, here we are. I'm having the first look here of the Budokan where we're playing tonight. It's going to be the biggest ever indoor gig we've ever done. This is live at the Budokan, baby. <laughs> this is where all the, the huge like sumo wrestling games are. <laughs> <laughs> and where Oasis and Dylan and Stones and uh, Guns N' Roses even. Where they wrestled. <laughs> I think we'll be pretty nervous walking out there, to be honest with you, but um, it'll be cool, you know? Thank you. There's going to be 9,000 people getting in here to watch the rock concert of the night, so I might as well get backstage with the band and start getting ready. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I have no class, but I'm in the band. Uh, uh, Hold on. <laughs> please show me pass. Oh, yeah. Yeah, pass. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Classic smiles out there. <laughs> It was the best feeling ever. I really felt like, you know, we'd done it. We got them all going, oh. And uh, so I felt like Freddie Mercury for a little bit. <laughs> I think this Japan tour has been really good, and I think I'm ready to do two more weeks here if I could. Thank you. Uh, very happy to be here, too.
There's probably no country on earth that doesn't have a long tradition of dolls, either as childhood playthings, religious totems, or some as collectibles. Which brings us, as always, to Japan, where dolls are all those things and so much more. The zeal for dolls here dates back centuries. Girls are given a set of traditional Hina dolls by their grandparents at birth or on their first birthday. And for the past 400 years or so, on every 3rd of March, a nationwide doll festival has brought traffic to a standstill. There's an official doll festival song that goes, <clears throat> Let's light the lanterns on the tiered stand. Let's set peach flowers on the tiered stand. Five court musicians are playing flutes and drums. Today is a joyful doll's day. Well, of course, it sounds slightly better in Japanese. And then on the 25th of September comes the Doll Burning Festival, which is great for the economy, because then everybody has to go out and buy new dolls all over again. In recent years, the diva of all dolls here has been Licker-chan, the Japanese Barbie. But while liquor mania is mostly confined to girls, men here have gone doll loopy too. The otaku, or nerds, are fervent collectors of figures related to their favorite manga or anime characters. But it's okay, because the objects of their adoration are usually lovely ladies. And as you'd expect, with a nation always on the move, a new doll generation is marching into power. Just as Superman was so much more than just a man, and you can look that up because it's a fact, so there exists a doll figure, or doll fee, which is more than just a doll. Super doll fee. Super doll fee! Kawaii! Yes, kawaii. Super doll fee is the most talked about, most coveted doll on the scene today. Standing 22 inches tall and costing three to 500 pounds or even more, the Super Dolphies are almost fully customizable. You can choose their skin, hair, clothing, eyes, head, hands, and body type. Two more things you should know. One, Super Dolphies enthusiastic owners are almost exclusively adults. And two, in Japan, this is not considered at all weird. What happened was, they served this girl at the window. At first, I had no intention of buying it because it was so expensive. But one day, all of a sudden, I thought, she's cute. Okay, just one, just this girl. And so I ended up, I don't use the word buy, I use the word to bring them home. So I brought her home, and the rest all came, one after the other. So she's one of the girls who have become a significant part of my memories. On weekdays, when I am at work, I can only play with them in the morning and at night. On a day off, if there is nothing else to do, I play with them all day long. Specialist Super Dolphy shops are now occupying acres of prime Tokyo real estate. Super Dolphy owners tend to be a dedicated lot, purchasing or creating vast wardrobes and imbuing the dolls with personalities and even emotions. This is Claire. She's a tomboy and full of energy. These two are supposed to be sister and brother. This one is her little brother, Chloe. He has a hard time controlling his energetic sister because she's too much of a tomboy. They follow the latest doll styles in glossy magazines like Fashion Doll Quarterly. For me, it's not just buying the dolls and displaying them. With these, we can make clothes. We can put makeup on the dolls and change their hair. We can make a doll that is the only one in the world. That is the real charm of these dolls. These trendy Super Dolphy fanciers like to take their dolls out on the town and then perhaps a private room in a karaoke parlor. There aren't many places where you can bring out such big dolls without causing trouble. It's not that we make it regular meeting, it's just that someone phones up suddenly and says, shall we meet up tomorrow? So it's very spontaneous, and then we think about which clothes to take. Yes, we look forward to it. But it's not all urban glitz. Other Super Dolphy fans enjoy homey get-togethers with fellow enthusiasts. Think of it as a play group for plastic children. <laughs> Is this real? Yes, it is. You can drink it. <laughs> She's a minor. She shouldn't be drinking. How old is Joe? 16. He's a minor then, but he doesn't look like 16 at all. I don't think just because you're a man that you can't be interested in dolls. 
Whether they are male or female, they reflect me. They reflect my ideal image, I think. You can't help loving them, especially if you can't create your own daughters yourself. Lest you think this might be one of those overhyped phenomena that only appeal to a small number of extreme characters, we take you now to Super Dolphy World Headquarters in Kyoto. Here, pilgrims from around the world come to worship at the spiritual home of Super Dolphy. There's a museum, classes in makeup and clothes making, a doll beauty salon, and on site doctors to repair injured dolls. <laughs> The Super Dolph is a mirror that reflects yourself. When you're happy, it is happy. When you're sad, it is sad. And the main attraction, birthing ceremonies in which fans take possession of their new Super Dolphies. Each and every customer meets their own destined doll. They fall in love with the doll in a way, thinking that the doll is a reborn form of themselves. Then they become an owner. Yes, here they create not only the dolls, but the mythology as well. The one who is allowed to have a life as a human by a holy heavenly spirit is now welcoming another you from your pure heart. If you're thinking cult, you might not be far off, though it's certainly one of the cuter cults out there. As for the future, big plans. So many pilgrims flock here, they've decided to open a Super Dolphy hotel on the premises. You'll be able to take a weekend break with your doll in a traditional Japanese tatami room. Japan's population is shrinking rapidly. It's a reproductive crisis. Can Super Dolphy be part of the reason? Well, I think we've all enjoyed more cuteness than a giant fluffy basket filled with newborn babies and freshly washed kittens frolicking under a sparkling rainbow while multi-hued hummingbirds drop sweet sugar candies into the mouths of pixies and elves and fairies and maybe tiny pocket-sized unicorns. But what have we actually learned? <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, Sai. Good night. <laughs> There's comedy and with stupid style tomorrow at 10.30 on BBC Three and next, Grime Scene Investigation. Estupendo.